Hello, my people. Hope we're doing well. Uh, this is the last video on vocab and properties for our calculus readiness review unit. I hope it hasn't been too painful. Uh, the first one, let's go ahead and jump in. First one is ordered pair. And uh, I know you're going to be shocked by this, uh, but an ordered pair is a pair of numbers that's ordered. Well, it's a little bit more than that, okay? But it is basically a pair of numbers uh, whose order is agreed upon. All right? And because it's agreed upon, it communicates, okay? And it is usually uh, in the, for, you know, like functions, most of the time when we're dealing with order pairs, uh, it will usually be input output for for in, for a given function okay now so we have that okay a pair of numbers whose order is agreed upon and actually you know means something uh, and that's and that's pretty important I mean there are a lot of things in mathematics that are a matter of convention because uh, something needs to mean the same thing to me and to you and to everybody else. I mean, that's if you haven't figured it out, that's why we have an order of operations, right? Because if there is not a particular order to the operations, then an expression uh, could mean wildly different things. It could express wildly different values to you and to me. And insofar as mathematics is governed by a general principle of precision, uh, not the only thing it's governed by, but uh, because precision is a part of sort of the mathematical universe, uh, if an expression doesn't mean one thing, then it doesn't mean anything, right? And so there's, there's, you've run into several things where basically they've done things, and it's not a fabric of the universe kind of thing, but it's a convention that is agreed upon so that we understand what you know what this notation means and that's basically all order pair is okay now a relation is a set of ordered pairs uh, and as we talked about in class there is finite ordered pairs and there are infinite ordered pairs and infinite ordered pairs we talked about basically those are equations Okay, um, there is an infinite set of ordered pairs. I can't list them out by hand, but I can express them. They all have the form, you know, x, you know, x plus two or whatever. Okay. Now a function, and usually when we're dealing with functions, we're dealing with equations. Though remember, they don't necessarily have to be equations. Okay, uh, you can actually have a they can actually have a, like a finite, you can actually have a finite relation and evaluate it for whether it's a function. Uh, yeah, and the thing is that it's, that's usually, usually not where, where, we, where we're at when we're dealing with functions, but a function is a relation uh, uh, wherein there is only one output for every input, okay? That means that no input has more than one output, and that's why the vertical line test works, okay? Now, domain is one of those, is, uh, so function, I definitely need you to remember this. This is an important one, okay? This is another important one. Uh, because usually when I say uh, define domain or I say what is the domain, uh, most students say X. Um, no, <laughs> okay? No, no, no. Uh, it is related to the input variable and the input variable is oftentimes X, yes. Uh, but domain is not just X. Those are not the same thing. And I, this is one of those ones where I want you to memorize it very specifically this way. It is the set of all possible inputs. Okay, so 
and all of those are important, okay? Possible inputs, right? And here's the reason why I say possible inputs, okay? Because there are two types of, there are two ways that the domain can be defined. And the way that the domain can be defined is if I have uh, f of x is equal to, you know, 1 or x over x squared minus 4, okay? Now you've dealt with rational functions before and you know that you can do it like this, okay? Now, if I say what value, if I say the domain is the set of all possible inputs, the question you should be asking yourself is this. What inputs are impossible? Okay? Because if you can identify those values that are impossible, then the domain is everything else, right? In this particular case, you know that there are two values that will make that denominator zero. So x cannot be equal to negative two, and x cannot be equal to two. Those are impossible input values, and therefore they are not part of a domain. And so my domain winds up being negative infinity to negative two, union negative two to two, union two to infinity, because all of those are possible inputs. Now, when the input is, is implied by the form of the function itself, that is what's known as implied domain. Okay, so if, if the domain or the limitations on the domain come from the form of the function itself, that is what's called implied domain. Now, of course, I can artificially limit the domain because I can have, you know, g of x is equal to 2, and I can say, okay, well, let's do, you know, x plus 4, but let's make it so that x can't be equal to plus or minus 2. This function has the same domain as this function, but the, the limitations on the domain were not implied by the form of the function itself. They were actually made explicitly and almost artificially like after the fact. Uh, so when you're dealing with domain, it needs to be the set of all possible inputs. And the question that goes along with it is what values are impossible because like I said if you can identify the impossible inputs the domain is everything else now remember the domain deals with inputs which is the independent variable okay the range deals with outputs or the dependent variable by very definition the dependent variable like the idea of possibility is extinguished already right this is simply the set of all outputs. That's it, okay? <clears throat> now, let's do one-to-one -one function. <clears throat> now, one-to-one -one function, uh, we've already seen that a function is a relation wherein there's only one output for every input. But uh, you do, in a, in a function, you can have a function where there's more than one uh, where there's more than one uh, in more than one input uh, for each output, okay, and so the relation doesn't necessarily go the other way. One to one function means that it is a function wherein wherein there is only one input for every output and the reason is this because a one-to-one -one function is also a function a function uh, <clears throat> that has an inverse function okay that's one way that people like to define it of course the reason why it has an inverse that's also a function is that when you take an inverse function 
remember the method by act to actually find an inverse function, you swap the x and the y. You swap the horizontal and the vertical. You swap the domain and the range. Uh, so if, if you're going to swap those things, then you're swapping the input and the output. And so you need that relationship of one to one, uh, one output for every input and one input for every output. You need the relationship to run both ways so that the original is a function and when you swap the variables, the inverse is also a function. Now an inverse function is basically, uh, and remember the definition of input that we have is that which undoes, okay? So an inverse function is a function that undoes what the original function does to the variable, does to the variable. Because uh, in the end, it actually, I mean, if we think about it, a function is really just a set of instructions of what we're doing to the variable, okay? So let's take f of x. Something is being done to x. In fact, four somethings are being done to x. Minus one, then it's being exponentialized, then it's being multiplied by two, and then it's being, then three is being added to it. Okay, well that's four things that are being done to the variable. And in order to, if I wanted to undo all of those four things, I would not only need uh, the correct operations, but I would need the correct operations in the correct order in order to undo all of those things. Uh, and actually this is the inverse function over here. Uh, now, there are two ways to find it. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through the first one. Now remember that when we're dealing with finding the inverse, uh, we simply need to, of course, change f of x to y, and then we need to swap the variables, okay? And we say, okay, well, let's, you know, use the order of operations in order to do all of this. Um, e to the y minus one, let's take the natural log of both sides, and we're gonna swap the sides of this whole thing natural log of one half x minus three and then of course we have y is equal to the natural log of one half x minus three plus one now here's the thing i notice that this is the same as this i actually didn't use this method to get it i want you to notice that remember when we're when we're taking the inverse uh we're swapping x and y okay we're swapping a domain and range swapping horizontal and vertical um, this, if you look at, look at the transformations, because the transformations are basically graphical representations of what you're doing to the variable. To the right one, so positive movement in the x direction of one unit, positive movement in the y direction of one unit, vertical stretch of two, horizontal stretch of two, vertical positive movement, three units. Horizontal positive movement, three units. So you can actually, if you know your transformations, you can, and you know, you know, obviously which uh, named function, which parent is the inverse of the other, you actually don't have to go through this process if you don't want to. You can just use the, you can use the transformations. Now remember, both of these are doing things to the variable. And remember when you did uh, inverse functions, in order to confirm that two functions were inverses of each other, what you did is you shoved one function inside of the other. Uh, and you, you were looking for the possibility of it simplifying down to just x almost as if what this function is doing to x, this function, when it's crammed inside of it, undoes what's being done to x, and all you're left with is x, right? Now, of course, these two cancel out. When you have an exponential, and you're basically an exponential base, like e, and it's raised to a logarithm of the same base, those undo each other, and you're left with two <coughs> times 
1 half x minus 3, and you ought to be seeing where this is going, and you have x minus 3 plus 3, and of course that's just x, ta-da! And of course, you know, the way that you were taught, you do f of g of x and g of f of x, and they both need to come out to x. Uh, but the whole reason for this, for this working is the fact that, again, it's about the undoing. This function, what this function does to the variable, when this one is crammed inside of it, this one undoes because it's doing the exact opposite things to the variable in the exact opposite order. Okay, let's go ahead and let's look at the rest of these definitions. Uh, Y-intercept, okay, when X is equal to zero. X-intercept, when y is equal to zero. Now the only reason why I think it's important to actually say that is when we are on the Cartesian plane. And here's the thing, like I know a lot of people call it the coordinate plane nowadays, but back in the day, like my teachers all called it the Cartesian plane. Cartesian plane because Descartes, okay? Descartes was one of the people who invented analytic geometry, meaning, you know, how to turn uh, how to turn notational representations of a function into a picture, basically graphing, okay? Uh, and of course they named the, the plane after him, Descartes Cartesian, okay? Uh, and basically this is the coordinate plane, same thing, uh, but, oh, and this is my pet peeve, it is never the grid. <sighs> Just don't call it the grid, at least not around me, okay? The reason is that when we, when we sit here and we look at the Cartesian plane, we call this the y-axis. We call it the y-axis because that's where we measure y. But you need to remember that the y-axis is actually x is equal to zero. That's the equation of the y-axis. And similarly, of the x-axis, that's y is equal to zero. Now we call it the x-axis because that's where we measure off our x values. But as a line, if we're looking for the equation of it, it is y is equal to zero as well, okay? Um, that brings us to the end of our wonderful overview and review of uh, vocab and properties. Uh, I hope a little bit of it was uh, new or you know, brought back memories of something that you had forgotten. I hope not all of it was uh, as insulting as it could have been. Uh, but this, this, this is basically the, the lexicon that we will be using in class. I will be using it a whole lot. It's just the language that I speak. Uh, please do study hard. These will be on the cumulative quizzes, which will be starting soon. Uh, if you have any questions, please do shoot me an email, and I will be happy to answer any and all questions. Bye-bye.